Let's talk about spectroscopy. Chemists use spectroscopy for a variety of purposes. In general chemistry, we use UV-Vis spectroscopy to learn about the light-absorbing nature of chemicals. In organic chemistry, we used NMR and FTIR to derive structural information of compounds. In PCHEM, we'll learn that in all spectroscopies, atoms or molecules absorb electromagnetic radiation and undergo transitions between allowed quantum states. Throughout PCHEM, we'll analyze these transitions to derive quantitative structural information about molecules. In this experiment, we'll use FTIR spectroscopy to observe the rho vibrational spectrum of HCl and DCl. From analysis of the acquired spectrum, you will learn about the internuclear separation of the two atoms and how this oscillator deviates from the ideal case of a harmonic oscillator. Before coming to lab, please read Engel and Reed 19.1 through 19.6 and experiment 37 in the Garland ebook. The rho vibrational spectrum of a molecule contains information about the vibrational and rotational levels of the molecule. Even though both rotations and vibrations will be observed simultaneously, we can simplify our analysis by first treating these motions independently. Let's start with some basics for vibrational spectroscopy. We can envision HCl as two simple spheres connected by a spring. Here, chlorine is green and hydrogen is white. At first glance, chlorine appears to be stationary because it's much more massive than hydrogen, but both atoms are in fact moving during the vibration. Vibrational energy levels are predicted by a simple model, the harmonic oscillator. If we solve the Schrodinger equation for the harmonic oscillator potential, we find the allowed energy levels. The energy levels of the harmonic oscillator, shown here in red, are given by the simple expression EV equals H nu times the quantity V plus one half. In this expression, nu is the frequency of the oscillation, which is related to the reduced mass and the force constant of our molecule by the relation nu equals one over two pi times the square root of k over mu. The harmonic oscillator is a mathematically simple way to compute vibrational energy. Unfortunately, most molecules are not true harmonic oscillators. In a harmonic oscillator, we observe that molecules are always bound. They never dissociate. To see dissociation, we must use a more complicated anharmonic oscillator. An anharmonic oscillator is different from a harmonic system in two important ways. First, the levels are not equally spaced. In an anharmonic system, the energy levels get closer together until we see our second difference. Unlike the harmonic system, the anharmonic shows a point where the molecules will dissociate. This is what we expect in most molecules. To correct our model, we add an anharmonic correction term. The equations for the harmonic and anharmonic oscillators can be seen here. Notice that the anharmonic expression contains the harmonic expression. Here, nu e is the vibrational frequency of the molecule at its equilibrium bond length, and nu e x e describes the degree of anharmonicity in our potential. The spectral analysis that we will perform will show how close, or not close, HCl is to a harmonic oscillator. Quantum mechanics tells us only certain transitions are possible, or allowed. We call these selection rules. We will commonly hear about two different types of selection rules general and specific selection rules. A general selection rule tells us about a property that a molecule must have in order to absorb a photon. The general selection rule for IR spectroscopy is that a vibration must have a dynamic dipole moment. This means that the dipole of the molecule must change through the process of the vibration. Let's see an example. Here we see the bending mode of carbon dioxide. During this vibration, we see a dipole is created as the molecule distorts from linear. We should expect to see this mode in an IR spectrum of carbon dioxide. If we look at the symmetric stretch of carbon dioxide, we do not see an induced dipole at any point during the vibration. We would not expect to see this mode using IR spectroscopy. Specific selection rules tell us, specifically, what quantum number transitions we should expect. In a harmonic oscillator, the specific selection rule is delta V equals 1. This selection rule is relaxed in the anharmonic case where, along with the delta V equals 1, we can also see delta V equals 2, 3, and so on. 
These transitions are only weakly allowed and are not always observed. Overtones can sometimes be observed by using highly sensitive instrumentation. We will see overtones in our experiment. They will allow us to determine how the molecular potential differs from a simple harmonic potential. The intensity of the transition in our spectrum gives us information on the population of states. We'll explore this in more detail in an upcoming experiment, but there are a few general ideas you should be aware of. The population of energy states occupied in a macroscopic sample is described by the Boltzmann distribution, shown here. In this equation, Ni is the population of state I, Gi is the degeneracy of state I, delta E is the energy difference between the two states, K is Boltzmann's constant, and T is the temperature of the sample. Let's see what Boltzmann tells us about the population of vibrational states of carbon monoxide at room temperature. Carbon monoxide has an energy difference of 2170 wave numbers between its ground and first excited vibrational states. We'll assume that the vibrational states both have a degeneracy of 1. From this, we calculate a ratio of 2.82 times 10 to the negative fifth. This tells us there are very few carbon monoxide molecules in the excited state at room temperature. If you look at table 19.2 in Engel and Reed, you find many molecules are in their ground vibrational state at room temperature. For our experiment, we can assume that the vibrations absorb from the V equals zero state to the excited state. But vibration is only one motion we expect in molecules. Quantum mechanics also predicts quantization of the rotations of a molecule. We can calculate the rotational energy levels by solving the Schrodinger equation for the rigid rotor. By doing this, we find the energy levels of the rigid rotor are given by the simple expression Ej equals Bej times the quantity j plus 1, where Be is the rotational constant specific to a molecule and j is our rotational quantum number. The rotational constant contains useful structural information. In the case of diatomics, the rotational constant consists of the reduced mass, mu, and the equilibrium bond length, Re. Unlike the harmonic oscillator, the energy levels of the rigid rotor are not equally spaced. In a rigid rotor, we find the spacings of the transitions are equal. The energy spacings of rotational levels are much smaller than vibrational energy levels. In HCL-DCL, you'll observe rotational energy levels on the order of one wave number, compared to 2900 wave numbers for vibrations. The rigid rotor is a simple model for rotations of a molecule, but there's a problem. Bonds are not rigid. This means we have to refine our model. In reality, bonds act similar to springs, so let's replace our rigid bond with a spring. By making this change, we also change the energy expression for our system. To account for the flexibility of bonds, we add the centrifugal distortion correction. Our refined expression is shown here, where DE is the centrifugal distortion constant. Just like vibrations, rotations have general and specific selection rules. The general selection rule for rotational spectroscopy is that molecules must have a permanent dipole moment. Molecules like chlorine will not have a pure rotational spectrum, whereas molecules like HCl will have a rotational spectrum. The specific selection rule for rotations is delta J equals plus minus one. Unlike vibrations, we usually do not see the selection rule relaxed. For our experiment, we'll see this rule as followed. If we want to know what levels are expected to have population and therefore appear in our spectrum, we return to the Boltzmann distribution. However, we recognize that the energy spacings are much smaller than the vibrational spacings. The Boltzmann distribution tells us that there is a greater amount of molecules in an excited rotational state when compared to vibrations. Again, let's use carbon monoxide as an example. In carbon monoxide, the ground and first excited rotational states are separated by 3.86 wave numbers. From this, we find a ratio of 0.982. This means the population of these two states are very similar and we should expect to see multiple J levels as starting points for transitions. The energy required to excite rotations is much smaller than that required for vibrations. Therefore, when we excite vibrations, we also excite rotations. When rotational and vibrational transitions can be observed together, we say we are performing row vibrational spectroscopy. 
In the simplest case, the rho vibrational energy levels are best described as a sum of the two independent models, the harmonic oscillator and the rigid rotor. Our final expression for the energy levels we'll probe in this experiment is given by the following expression. Here we've broken down the equation into three components, one that represents the anharmonic oscillator, one for the not so rigid rotor, and a final term that accounts for the coupling of the vibrational and rotational motion. In this experiment, you will record the transition frequencies observed in HCL and DCL. These are related to the energy levels that we have formulated here. After you assign the quantum numbers V and J to your transitions, you will use a linear regression to solve for the constants underlined here in red. More detailed information for this experiment can be found in the lab handout. In the next video, we'll put this knowledge to use by acquiring the rho vibrational spectrum of HCL and DCL.